Uh, welcome everybody to the Injuries Teaching Day. Hope you've had fun this morning. Um, Sarah asked me to do a session on head and C-spine injuries. So what can I meaningfully teach in 45 minutes uh, about head injuries and C-spine injuries? That's a pretty big ask. Excuse me, nudge the house. <laughs> um, so the, the main aims are obviously to stay within 45 minutes so you don't get bored, uh, but also to maybe try and provoke some thought around what matters. What's the context clinically um, for these two, uh, frankly, very common presentations in pediatric ED and hopefully draw out some useful principles for your future practice that would apply to both. So by way of context, there are 4 million paediatric ED attendances in the UK every year, approximately. Um, and that's quite a lot. I mean, there's only 13, 14 million children in the country. Um, so that says a lot. There are 700,000, nearly a million, uh, attendances with head injury every year. Now, that's across adult and paediatrics, but even so, that's a big number. Uh, it is a very common reason to come to the local emergency department. So pre-COVID, -tar, pre Tan told me that there were 700 major paediatric traumas per year. So a considerably smaller number in the context of 4 million attendances uh, to paediatric EDs and 700,000 head injuries. Only 700 would be classed as major trauma. To be fair, about 80% of that 700,000 were subsequently classified as minor head injury, which I don't think would surprise any of you. Three quarters of the major paediatric traumas uh, had some degree of severe head injury among the constellation of injuries, uh, which again is not hugely surprising and goes some way to explain why neurosurgery is such a prominent feature in paediatric trauma calls. Less than 1% of paediatric major traumas had an identifiable severe neck injury, though considerably less frequent. And smaller still, only 60 deaths in the UK during the last Tarn audit uh, of, as a result of uh, major trauma in paediatrics. So from 4 million attendances down to 60 deaths, and hopefully that gives you some useful context. I think it's fair to say that head and neck injury presentations in paediatrics are very common, and they are thankfully very rarely serious. Uh, but it's also fair to say that when, when they are serious, it can be catastrophic. Um, with uh, life-limiting uh, or life-threatening sequelae. I think it's fair to say that uh, head and neck injuries in children are somewhat anxiety-provoking to um, pretty much everyone involved, uh, patients, parents, and professionals. For parents, it's self-explanatory. You know, they're worried about their child. Uh, they may have dropped their child or run them over, um, or they were it was certainly on their watch. There's often a degree of guilt in addition to the obvious anxiety about the welfare of their child um, and, and what's happening to them. And there's that empathy that parents have for their children um, if, they, if they've suffered harm or if they're uncomfortable in pain. There's a lot of worry there. The patient might be worried just about this rather dubious recess team circling them like vultures. Um, staring at them with um, ill intent is all I can say. I don't know who they are. They're all complete strangers. But uh, And this was some time ago. But uh, we need to bear in mind that uh, we can provoke anxiety in our patients, particularly if they're strapped down to a trolley, staring at the ceiling, counting the holes in the ceiling tiles. And then the professionals can be anxious for a number of reasons. I think number one in those is uh, not wanting to miss anything serious, the, the anxiety of, um, of getting it wrong um, and dealing with the level of expectation uh, that is often put upon us uh, with these sorts of presenting complaints. So far cleverer people than me have done a lot of work uh, for you and me to help us to filter out the children with serious head and neck injuries uh, and how best to work them up in terms of imaging and management. And I am not going to go through all of that in 45 minutes, considering there's a whole body of work for heads and a whole body of work for next. Suffice to say, I would expect those of you from an EM background or PEM background to be pretty au fait with these uh, flowcharts or your local version of the same, because um, these really do guide your decision making, and rightly so, because they are derived from a number of um, significant evidence bases um, that help you screen out the serious injury. There are other clinical decision rules as well. This is Nexus, um, which again, are, are rooted in common sense uh, and um, uh, kind of irrefutable in that regard uh, when it comes to making decisions about whether or not to image or whether or not to clear um, the injured neck in front of you or the head injury. And APLS has had a go as well. Um, they've got a, a, an algorithm for pretty much every presentation. This is the neck one, for example, and it's more of the same sort of thing. 
So what I wanted to focus on is this bit in the middle, the bit between the kid with, with obviously no injury and the kid with obviously a serious injury. That's where we kind of exist in the ED. That's where our anxieties lie. It's probably a thing, but it's possibly something and we don't want to miss something, do we? Because uh, that could be bad. So that's where we're going to stay uh, for the remainder of this talk um, having a think about some principles to apply when we're a bit stuck. Uh, and nothing exemplifies the, this kind of concept uh, more to me when it comes to head and neck injuries than, than these sorts of presentations that I'm going to show you. So imagine, if you will, that a gorgeous 10-month-old little one is brought into the department, very concerned mum, GP letter saying, needs to go to a &E straight away for a CT. And the story is that a couple of days ago, this 10 month old demonstrated their developmental level by climbing over the bars of their cot for the first time and stacking it on the hardwood floor, cried immediately, seemed fine afterwards. Mum was giving baby a bath today and she's got lovely, lovely frizzy hair. And in the process of um, cleaning the frizzy hair, mum noticed an almighty dent in the baby's head, which is pretty crazy. Helpfully, um, identified by that finger in this random Google image, um, I notice. So baby's got a dented head, suspicion of depressed skull fracture, baby needs a scan. The child is completely well, has demonstrated in the last 48 hours, absolutely no symptoms of either a sore head uh, or raised intracranial pressure, eating and drinking fine, no vomiting, no neurology. But invariably, these, pe these presentations get a CT head after a long-winded discussion about should we just watch and wait or, or should we scan them because we don't know what the brain underneath the skull is doing. And sure enough, they get scanned. And that's what it shows. And I can't see the chat, so if anybody's already got the diagnosis, then um, well done you. But this is one of my all-time favourite fracture patterns. This is the ping-pong fracture. So the skull table, kind of like a buckle fracture, it dents underlying uh, brain tissue is absolutely fine no no cognitive injury as it were um, and um, it will remodel completely uneventfully and doesn't really need any intervention you can refer it to neurosurgery on refer a patient and they'll um, Aida will come back and say meh um, with ping pong balls you can put them in boiling water just as an aside uh, and they will pop back out but that is I think largely considered unethical to do on babies heads they will remodel on their own if we skip to next, similar sort of story. So this is uh, an image of the particularly brutal tag rugby scene. Um, patient is playing tag rugby at a fairly high level when um, contact is made and they are spear tackled, landing in a crumpled heap uh, on their head. Everyone in the crowd goes, oof, and that looks nasty. But the kid gets back up. Kid gets back up and he plays on for 10, 15 minutes. And then he starts to hold the left side of his uh, neck shoulder, goes to his coach and says, coach, my neck's really hurting. I, I don't think I can play anymore. Coach says, not to worry. Better get um, better get to the sideline. There's a St. John's ambulance on the sideline. He comes and has a look at him. Uh, and before you know it, an ambulance is called. And I like to think that there's some kind of dramatic police style takedown um, at the point that the ambulance arrives. Get on the floor. The child is wrestled to the ground and strapped to a board. Collars applied, probably, maybe, who knows, depends on how up to date everyone is, um, and they are transported to your emergency department, whereupon you establish that um, with some simple analgesia, um, the child is already nodding and shaking their head. Uh, they have no obvious neurology now, although they did describe a little bit of tingling in their hands at some point. That's all gone away, um, and they're tender down one side, on the left side. There's not really much in the way of midline tenderness, and they're already moving their neck whether you want them to or not, despite the collar. Uh, and this is my other favourite uh, sort of injury. This is the stinger. So when pressure on, uh, classically in rugby, when a, when a tackle hits you in the, in the side of the neck, uh, you feel it in your brachial plexus. Uh, and you can feel it for a little while. Um, although I get nervous after a few minutes, the books say you can have this for, for an hour or so before everything get, gets better. No C-spine injuries, uh, no residual injuries, all goes away. So those two sorts of cases are the kind of things I'm thinking about in this kind of gray area um, between, you know, obviously no injury and obviously serious injury, which makes life difficult for us because we don't want to miss something serious. So we'll have a think about what sort of principles, what sort of tools we can employ when we're seeing these kind of presentations uh, or variations thereof um, in daily practice. The main thing is to be vigilant, to be mindful of the potential for serious injury. I think that goes without saying, 
but you'd be surprised how sunny disposition uh, some people have. It'll probably be all right. It is not necessarily the best way to start um, a clinical case in ED. Um, if you're always pessimistic like me, you can only be pe pleasantly su surprised when it goes well. But thinking about potential injury, factoring in the mechanism, the age of the child um, uh, and the, the kind of overall plausibility of it all will stand you in good stead when you're then working through those algorithms we showed earlier, deciding on whether or not imaging is indicated or not. The next thing is to remember that we're looking for clinically significant injuries in our imaging uh, and our interventions. So you don't need a scan to tell you that you had a head or neck injury. You were there. You remember that, or maybe you don't, in which case you probably do need a scan. But the, the point of the scan is to identify the, the level of midline shift, the expanding bleed that needs neurosurgical intervention, the depressed skull fracture, sure. Okay, but bear in mind, that's what we're about in the emergency department setting. Okay, I, I see more and more people doing really great things about using, using their clinical nows and interpreting the, the NICE guidelines in the spirit that they were intended to identify people who have a head injury, moderate head injury, but don't need a scan. However, they do need an important safety net and some advice about concussion. And that's brilliant. We need to get pretty au fait with how we approach risk in our practice, but also how we how we explain risk and how we share uh, an understanding of risk with families. Families come to us um, increasingly with an expectation of uh, a test and output uh, and ideally leaving with some kind of medicine. Um, and we need to help them and ourselves understand that everything we do, all clinical decision making is a balance of risk. We can't always be right. If we were aiming to always be right in that sense, we will over investigate and we will cause harm. The, uh, the under uh, ones have got uh, an increased risk of one in a thousand if you CT their head, maybe even one in 1500 um, of a lethal malignancy from that head CT. And although that does drop, and hopefully with technology that will drop further um, as we do less radiation in our scans, but as it stands, that's a decent risk if you were already feeling that this scan is going to be normal. Uh, and it's not likely to change your management. Bear that in mind. Clinically significant injuries are what we're looking for, and we need to balance risk. There are tools that can help you um, explain uh, and help parents understand that everything we're doing is about risk. Uh, and you'd be surprised how on board um, parents can be when it's explained to them in the right terms uh, about the risk of um, missing a serious injury uh, versus the, the risk of causing a cancer, for example, with imaging. Uh, and everything I'm saying about the head, obviously, is equally, if not more important um, when we're talking about the neck. Um, obviously, there's some fairly important structures in the pediatric neck that are growing. And if any of you try to order a CT neck, um, you will have met resistance from our friendly radiologists, hopefully. So that brings me to the next key point, which is keep calm and manage expectations. So very often there is expectation for you to find what's wrong. And as I said before, you don't need a scan to tell you that you had an injury, you were there. We need a scan to help guide our management, but if, the, if plan A and plan B already don't aren't likely to change, then you, you need to manage and bring the parents often on a bit of a journey in, in understanding the reasoning around um, not imaging or the reasoning around um, not putting it in a plaster. Um, if we deviate from heads and necks, don't put them in plasters. That's crazy. Okay. Uh, Alara, Skiwara and Nye uh, are not three sisters from Swansea um, at a Welsh match, but they are three acronyms that we need to be aware of uh, as key concepts. So talking about imaging, ALARA stands for as low uh, or as little as realistically achievable. And that's the Royal College of Radiologists um, principle when it comes to trauma imaging in pediatrics. Growing tissues being more sensitive to radiation exposure. If you can get away with it, if you can target your imaging, um, much more so in children than adults, uh, then that is preferable. Skiwara stands for spinal cord injury without radiological abnormality. And there's already been an excellent lightning learning on that. So I won't bore you to death with it. But the concept that children being flexible and bendy can injure their spinal cords without necessarily having radiographic findings is something you need to bear in mind. Because even if you do these images, they can be normal. It doesn't mean that your spinal cord is not injured. And we have to be very careful. And then sadly, NAI is the worst of the bunch. So NAI, non-accidental injury, is something that we have to be very vigilant about, um, especially as, as a potential cause of the injury. So 10% of the major pediatric traumas we were talking about, of those 700, um, were NAI, 
uh, in the under twos. So there's a cohort of children who you will potentially be dealing with who won't come to you with a, with a coherent history or a compatible mechanism, or even any sense that this is injury. They might come non-specifically vomiting with a wishy-washy history of um, being ill for a few days, and this will be subsequently found to have been a trauma. The next key principle is not to make it worse. Okay, and that's twofold. So don't make it worse by not immobilizing. Don't, be, don't make it worse by trying to immobilize if the child doesn't want you to. So the APLS, for example, and other life support courses moved away from the routine use of collars uh, some years ago now um, on the grounds that A, as I said, C-spine injuries are pretty uncommon, even in major trauma, significant ones, I should say, uh, and B, collars are not particularly well um, Commercially available collars are not particularly well made for the size varieties that we see. So where possible, if we're genuinely suspecting neck injuries, manual inline stabilization, or blocks and tape are preferred, putting a collar on in a child who's going to be distressed is inevitably going to cause more harm. An ill-fitting tight collar can raise intracranial pressure by decreasing venous return, um, or, or it can just plain old scare them into moving when they shouldn't be moving. So best shied away from got to bear in mind there are caveats to all of these things the unconscious child uh, the, the significantly traumatized child or the intubated child um, are all children who a you're going to want to immobilize because you can't adequately assess them uh, and b the the presence of a collar just makes you think about the neck when you're mobilizing them for other re reasons like turning them for cares so the collar's not completely out but by and large we spend more time taking them off than we do putting them on in ed analgesia wouldn't be a peds talk without a mention of analgesia and there is no barrier to oral analgesia, even being immobilized on a trauma trolley. Um, you can use bendy straws and liquid preparations. The rectal route is available, although we're British, so that's beyond the last resort. Um, but don't forget your analgesia. You will not mask anything. Uh, being pragmatic from experience, those with significant C-spine injuries or skull fractures, much like arm and leg fractures, it hurts when they move it, they don't move it. So um, you, you're not going to mask things with simple analgesia, but you might just make them comfortable enough uh, to get through the uh, get through the journey. Time is another kind of an important thing to bear in mind, the value of it. Now, I know we have four hour targets uh, and all that jazz, but don't don't neglect the time that you have with the patient. Time is a completely legitimate pediatric investigation, and it's really useful in both head and neck injuries uh, because you can see things progress to a certain extent, either in the positive trajectory or you can see new things develop that that make you pull the trigger on that scan or, or that referral to another specialist. It does, as they say, heal all wounds, but bear in mind time also deals them. And in particular with necks, the immobilized patient, even if they're not on a scoop or a spinal board, will get progressively more stiff and more in pain by virtue of being strapped down and having nothing to do but think about their, their neck injury. So the quicker we can get them clinically cleared, the better. Uh, and ideally, um, when you're receiving these patients off the, off the ambulance trolley, if you can get them clear, um, brilliant. That's a quick win. And then the last thing really to think about is just where you fit um, experience-wise, job role-wise in this kind of escalator. Um, and um, hopefully that will change as you grow in experience and seniority. You might be at the very bottom um, of the reass re escalator, um, in which case you, you might feel less confident about clinically um, being happy to observe head injuries or clinically clearing C-spines, and you might um, escalate to a senior or you might refer to a specialist and you might image. Maybe over time that will change. Uh, I hope so, but um, as I say, we're all on, a, on something of an educational journey um, and it won't be to the detriment of patients if you're safe um, and following any of these kind of available algorithms. So there we are, that's a, a whistle-stop tour uh, through head and neck injuries. The idea being that that would leave time for me to, or, or Sarah, to wrestle with the chat uh, and see if you guys have got any specific sort of uh, questions. Uh, and that's, uh, that's the uh, eerily sinister recess team asking you again. And there's a summary uh, of what I've hopefully covered. Um, but yeah, neck and head injuries, super common, super anxiety provoking, rarely serious, but potentially really bad so you know we, we take them seriously but then in terms of principles to apply you've got all the algorithms you possibly need and for the stuff that doesn't fit just like i said think about those principles uh, and that should see you right thank you uh, thank you gareth uh, there's no questions in the chat at the moment but I'll yes i'm done email. i retire undefeated <laughs> uh, does anyone have any questions for gareth at all okay what have we got here <laughs> 
Mm -mm -mm -mm. Uh, I've got a question if that's all right, Gareth. I mean, of of the um, major traumas that we see in children, how many, do you know roughly how many present to a major trauma center versus a major trauma unit? Because lots of lots of us are just trauma units, aren't we? Is there, is there a yeah yeah so so the um, the again we're a bit we're a bit data poor because of COVID and because Tarn prior to COVID were giving us a really useful summary every year. So the last summary I saw um, it was fifty two percent of pediatric major traumas did not attend a major trauma centre um, and partly because about 27-ish percent just under a third um, does not come by ambulance still and so mm -hmm. as, as awesome as trauma networks are and they still are even if you present to a trauma unit and have a secondary transfer that's still yeah. good um, the the kind of pattern of behaviour with paediatric major trauma still requires the DGH the trauma unit and even the non-trauma unit to be savvy with the initial receipt and stabilization of major pediatric trauma because the other thing is that um like i said in that year that tarn measured 700 across the entire uk across 14 million children um is nothing um, no. so you know it is whether you're at a trauma unit or a trauma center actual um proper mashed trauma in mm -hmm. pediatrics is rare uh, and so we all, we, we, none of us see it a huge amount. We, um, obviously, if you're in a center, your trauma responses, your trauma calls will be more frequent, but your exposure yeah. to primary major trauma is still not hugely more frequent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, has put a, a question about sort of vomiting and head injury uh, and sort of, you know, watching and waiting, you know, a prolonged watch and wait strategy because, um, you know, sometimes people. Oh, yeah, that's, that's a cracking, cracking question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so we need to put pediatricians and radiologists in a room and then just not open the door until, you know, one of them's left standing. They, so the, the vomiting stays on the NICE guideline, although between uh, in various iterations, it's watered down success successively. And that's the recognition that vomiting is horrendously nonspecific, but it is also incredibly consistent in those who do have expanding intracranial bleeds um, from experience, having, having um, sent, <laughs> sent people home and then come back as per safety net advice. They just vomit, vomit, vomit. Um, so yeah, the, the difficulty there is one of experience and um, comfort zones because radiologists would be um, huge advocates of um, prolonged observation and um, minimizing early CT scanning, but pediatricians and if you're in a trauma unit that cover where surgeons cover your um, head injuries that they're very very reluctant to take a patient without a scan uh, and that is not based in any kind of established guidance um, but that said with the nice guidance being what it is uh, that you end up in a circular argument because the nice guidance would say if there's ongoing vomiting to scan and um, so you're not really going to win that one until the next iteration of the guidelines if that does indeed take vomiting um, uh, f further down in, in terms of significance. Any difference in spe specificity of vomiting at a later stage rather than an earlier stage? Now, I don't know uh, in that sense. As I say, the, um, the, my own kind of experience and my own understanding of the literature is more about patients continuing to vomit uh, and certainly having sent an extradural home um, it was more that they they were vomiting every morning um and then they were sort of getting on not quite right and then they went on a trampoline yikes um and, and just kept vomiting again so they came back in and uh, had an extra dural, um that hadn't been clinically appreciated at the uh, original attendance um i don't know whether late vomiting vomiting a later stage because the, the counter argument there as is often the case in pediatric presentations is um you know head injury yesterday uh, fine afterwards fine all day started vomiting come to a and &E because head injury and vomiting equals bad uh, and then on arrival is febrile and of course we've done what humans do and we've attached the vomiting to a significant episode in in the past 24 hours when it's a complete red herring so th there's arguments either way i suppose lisa yeah 